Father God, we come to you this morning as your children. You're the greatest father that anyone could have. You're the greatest friend that anyone can have. We're so grateful for you. God, I do pray that this morning as we look in your scriptures, we can, yes, be grateful and thankful for our mothers who brought us into this world and brought us up. But Father, even more than that, that we would have a heart to honor and glorify you. And Father, I know that when I glorify you, when I honor you with my life, I do a better job taking care of my mom. Father, thank you for this chance to preach. Please speak through me. Father, I do pray you'd shut my mouth if it's not your words and open my mouth to say what you would have me to say. Speak through the words this morning. Help us to have an incredible day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In John chapter 15. Say amen when you get to John 15. All right, you guys beat me. That's good. Let's start in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruits, while every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a convicting passage. Apart from me... You can do nothing. Verse 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into fire, and burned. You know, when you're out camping, you're looking for those branches. You want to start a little fire? You You don't go grab the green ones that are producing fruit. You grab the ones that are all dried up and withered, and you know it's going to burn fast. That's what you're looking for. But if you're trying to be a disciple... You want to be a green branch, amen? Amen. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father's loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Right there we see how to remain in his love. We just need to put into practice what the scripture says. Amen? Amen. Just as I obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Isn't it interesting how when we're disobedient, we're unhappy people. And yet when we're obedient, we're like, I feel great about my life. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's just joy. And the Father is joyful too. Verse 12, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus was the perfect example in that, was he not? (laughs) You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. You know, it's interesting. Old Testament verses associated with the, with, with the vine, that talk about the vine. Most of the time refer to Israel, the nation of Israel, as faithless and fruitless. It's kind of scary as I was studying through this passage this week, how many times in the Old Testament it says, you're a faithless vine, you're a fruitless vine, you're a vine that's been cut off. I mean, it's like over, oh my, oh my gosh. So then Jesus in the New Testament turns it upside down. He goes, guys... The disciples who follow me, spiritual Israel, 
you're going to be a fruitful vine. You're going to be a faithful vine. All you have to do is stay connected to me. You got to get into my word, get to know my word, and then you'll have it as head knowledge. Have it as heart knowledge as you live it out. And your vine will produce fruit. You're going to be filled with fruits. Is your life full of fruit even this morning? Or do you feel like the Old Testament vine? I'm fruitless. I'm guilty. I have shame. A, because you haven't been forgiven. But B, because you're just maybe not living like a disciple. Where are you at this morning? Are you fired up that you can produce fruit for God? Are you a little bit scared that the gardener's coming? You know what I'm talking about? A couple of things there. There are four players in this allegory, in this story that Jesus tells. There's the gardener. Who's the gardener, guys? God. Then there's the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus. Now here's what's interesting. I'm not going to point out that Mark said us, but, uh, you know. (laughs) But see, here's the thing. Mark said what a lot of people think. Many people believe that the church is the vine. Oh, if I'm in the church, I'm going to be okay. No, 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 no. God is the gardener. The vine is Jesus. So the real question is, are you connected to Jesus? You ever seen one of those branches this morning? I was out in my yard. And I was praying about the the sermon. And I looked up, and sure enough, in this beautiful tree I have in my backyard, there's this giant dead limb just sitting there. Like, what the heck? I just pulled it off. Threw it over the fence. (laughs) It was my fence, and I threw it toward the trash bin. Although I got to be open. A couple weeks ago, I was trimming one of my... Branch, this isn't in the, in the notes, so this is a freebie here. I was trimming one of the bushes in my backyard. There's this beautiful vine that has these little white flowers with a little red speck on it. It's like beautiful. It's like this thing is prolific. And I have three of them in the backyard. One of them is kind of a little rinky-dink, and he's starting to come up. The second one is like pretty good size, but it had all kind of weeds in it. I had to kind of literally knock out so many weeds, I, kill, I had to kill off part of the vine. But the third one is this giant, enormous thing, and it was so big, it about, uh, about, about four feet of it was hanging over my, um, the, the house next door to me. And nobody lives there. Until yesterday. <laughs> so uh, can I just be open? So last week I was trimming the vine because it was too big and I just let it fall in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> and then yesterday this moving truck drives up and I go, oh no. <laughs> so I quickly went over as a good neighbor would, right? I go, hi! <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, Helen and I got to meet the neighbors and everything and I, I didn't quite have the guts yet to tell him that I cut off the vines and put it in his yard. So hopefully today I can have the guts to get over there and say, listen, last week, I didn't think anybody was going to move in here for a while. So there you go. I have now been open for the day. You know, what's interesting is God is the gardener and Jesus is the vine. And he says, hey, if you stay in me, you're going to produce a lot of fruit. The third player in the story are the branches. That's us. That's the church. It's interesting that Jesus can't become an unproductive vine. But the branches can. Members of the church, people that are connected, grafted into Jesus, we can become an unproductive vine and dead so much so that the Father, the gardener is going to come and just lop us on off if we're not connected to Him. So often we get focused on the fruit. Oh, i got to produce fruit. And you're just trying to squeeze out some fruit. i got to get some fruit. God, please give me some fruit. And Jesus goes, stop worrying about the fruit. Get connected to me. I'll take care of that. The fourth player is the fruit. And every piece of fruit are seeds of a new plant. Look with me in John chapter 12. And John 12, verse 24, the Bible says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it. 
While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. What did Jesus do in serving his Father? He produced many disciples. And he simply says, guys, come follow me. And then like I did, I died to myself. Jesus died to all temptation. He died to himself day after day with a bunch of whiny, complaining, snot-nosed people like us. Served, loved, taught them, healed them, gave them food, and then we crucified him. And he rose from the dead. He says, now you're ready. Stop being a dead vine and come follow me. Amen. Connect yourself to me. This morning, be honest with yourself. Are you connected to Jesus? See, a person connected to Jesus is going to produce what Jesus produces. If you graft a branch into a tree, it's going to produce what that tree produces. We've been grafted in, disciples. So we need to produce what he produces. If you're not producing fruits, it's simply because you're not in the vine. But I want to challenge you to stop worrying about the fruit. You concern yourself with are you close to Jesus. See, quite often, growing up, I thought being close to Jesus was, well, I went to church on Easter and Sunday and Mother's Day. And that was it. My heart maybe showed up a couple of times a year, but my body was there every week. When my body and my heart showed up, after I became a disciple, then I started seeing the fruit of God starting to come out of my life. Are you producing the kind of fruit that Jesus produces? It's interesting. A vine left to itself will produce a good deal of unproductive growth. You know, as you guys know, I, I'm, I do my own gardening at my house. Hopefully you know that. I talk about it all the time. Come on. So if you're visiting, you didn't know that. But I am the gardener for my house. And so I take care of my lawn, I take care of the bushes and the trees, and I mean, I love it. It's something I do. It's my day off. Thursday, I take a little bit of time off, and that's what I do on my day off. And you're like, why would you work on a day off? Because I really like it. <laughs> but I've learned a lot. You know what I found is some plants do better in other parts of the yard. Some grass does better, better in other parts of the yard. Some trees do better with less water, and some do better with more. You guys with me? Yep. It's like Disciples. Some disciples do better in Houston than they do in Orlando. I mean, Mark did pretty well here, but, but over there, he's doing a great job. In different places, the gardener has to take care of the plant. Plant has to have the light of the sun. Plant has to have water. A plant has to have nutrients to grow. A plant has to have all these things to fulfill its purpose. And what is that? To produce fruits. Look in Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, we maybe get another glimpse of what it means to be in the vine or remain in the vine. Or the actual word is abide in Jesus. How do we do that? In verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. See guys, in the Old Testament, they would have a sacrifice that was alive. They would kill it and then place it on the altar. In the New Testament, you and I are the living sacrifices. The problem with a living sacrifice is that it has a tendency to want to jump off of the altar. <laughs> like, I ain't going to sacrifice today, I'm out of here. And every day you have to die to yourself. What self wants to do is... Maybe not what Jesus wants you to do. You know, I don't know about you, but I love watching TV and sitting around doing absolutely nothing. I don't know if Jesus would do that. I'm not going to produce the kind of fruit that Jesus would produce if I'm sitting around watching TV all day. Or being lazy. Or maybe I get myself into sin and I'm playing games with the world. But really right here, he says your, your worship... Is to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What is the will of God, guys? 
that every man can hear the message and be saved. That's his will. That's his heart. And here's what's scary to me. He leaves it up to us, a bunch of derelicts that tend to want to jump off the altar, that tend to become dead vines. He leaves it up to us. He says, I want you guys to go to every nation. I want you to learn how to die to yourselves, sacrifice yourself so other people can hear the message. This is what he's called us to do. And that takes sacrifice. I think Mark is in town visiting his family. Mark had to move away from family to go take care of the gospel in another city. That's the kind of heart that it takes. I'm sure that's tough. My family's in Louisiana. I mean, that's a pretty good drive. And I love my family. But I have chosen to seek first the kingdom, and it's going to come first. And because of that, God is going to produce much fruit in my life. This morning, are you producing the fruit that Jesus wants you to produce? Let's go back to John chapter 15. Right here he says, in verse 4, remain in me and I will remain in you. Abide in me is that word. Somebody help me out. Raise your hand. If you can help me understand, how do I remain in Jesus? How do I abide in Jesus? Help me out. Zach. What's that? Get into his word. What else? How do you abide in Jesus? Repentance. How do you abide in Jesus, guys? Follow his word. Pray. Guys, at the end of the day, if you want to remain in the vine, if you want to abide in Jesus, you got to do the things that Jesus did. you got to walk with him. I think a weakness that many disciples have, many people who call themselves Christians have, is they don't take time every day to get into the Word and let it change their hearts. You want a transformed life? you got to get into the Word of God. You want a transformed thinking? Stop watching so much TV and get the Word of God in there. You know, maybe you listen to music that's like kind of worldly. A lot of junk gets on under your mind. What are you thinking about after a song that's talking about, I went to the bar and I met a girl and I went home with her and, hey, praise Jesus. No, you're putting that garbage into your mind. And so it's going to start coming out of your heart. Are you remaining in the vine? Are you abiding in him? Or are you drifting away? I believe with all my heart that every single person needs to have a time in the word of God every single day. Jesus taught depending on him was a daily thing. The way we get into the vine is depending on God by getting the scriptures in there to change my mind. I think a lot less worldly than I used to because I read the scriptures every day. And all of you probably need to thank God for that because I'm a worldly, sinful, prideful person. And I don't like people. People bug me. I'm serious. But people didn't bug Jesus. And so I need to become more and more like him. But if I'm not in the vine, if I'm not connected to Jesus, I'll be more like Matt than like Jesus. And he's going to cut me off. See, if you want to remain in the vine, point number one, you're going to bear much fruit for his glory. Look at verse 8. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples, I believe with all my heart that you and I will bear more fruit when we let the word transform us. But secondly, we need some pruning. Look here in verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes or he cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. You know, I've talked many times about how I take care of the garden and I have to prune the plants on back. And I want to give you some living examples of pruning. You guys ready? Okay. Well, you have to have a plant if you want to prune. And you have to have some tools. I got a couple of tools. So, you know, when you got a little problem with your plant, it needs a little pruning, you might use a knife. So I can cut this little guy off right here. There you go. I pruned it. Every now and then, you have a little more you got to deal with. I'm coming. Come on, man. 
And so you need one of these. You ever seen these guys? These guys are awesome. I can go a little further here. Mm. Oh, yeah. Ah, it's looking better. Isn't that awesome? You know, sometimes pruning comes in the form of a little talk with one of your friends. Bro, what you did the other day, that was really selfish. Let me show you a scripture. <laughs> Maybe it goes a little deeper sometimes. Sis, you didn't do the dishes. That was selfish. <laughs> A little scripture about that. And then every now and then, you really got some junk going on in there. You know, bro, I just got to tell you, you were lazy all week. Your room's a mess. You didn't care about your roommates. That Bible said you were going to get into, you slept through it. You know, there's a correction that comes, and then there's a rebuke. I don't know about you, but I thank God for some of the rebukes I've gotten in my life. I needed to have my behind kick because I can be a real derelict sometimes. And i got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I thank God for the men who love me enough to tell me the truth. Men that God put in my life to tell me the truth are men that probably will help me get to heaven. And if it wasn't for some big pruning shears sometimes, I might not be here. And for some of you, you need a little more than that. So, sometimes you just won't listen. And, uh, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Oh my God. And people have to keep talking to you. And keep talking to you. And keep talking to you. And then you need one of these bad boys. You guys ready? Come on, man. You might need some of this. Here it comes. It's coming. Oh, no. I have no gas. Lucky for you guys, they probably would have kicked us out of the hotel. <laughs> but you know, seriously, for some of us, we don't listen. You don't read your Bible. You don't pray to God. You want to call yourself a Christian and you show up at church when it's convenient. The sin of this world comes back into your life. Over and over again. And next thing you know, there's a dead little part of you that's starting to take over. And sometimes you need a good pruning. Where are you guys at this morning? Are you really in the vine? Or have you let the world come back and take over? If we're going to produce a lot of fruit we got to be willing to get cut sometimes by the Word of God. you got to be willing to get a little pruning, and sometimes it takes a lot of pruning. I'm actually really glad I didn't put gas in it beforehand. It probably would have started. That would have been better. <laughs> Where are you at this morning? I want you to really take an honest assessment of your heart. Do you avoid the pruning because you just don't want to change? When people talk to you, do you just, yeah, 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 I got it. Or do you really take it to heart? The people in this church want nothing more than to help you get to heaven. They may not perfectly tell you what they need to tell you. They might not tell you at the exact right time. But I know this. The people in this church love God. And they want to help you get to heaven. At the end of the day, us being in the vine is an issue of heaven and hell. Are you being pruned by the word? And if you are, you know what's going to happen? You're going to produce much fruit for his glory. Amen? Let's go back to John 15. And pick it up. In verse 18.
It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen the miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this was to fill, fulfill what was written in the law. They hated me without reason. Is there any reason at all to hate Jesus Christ? And yet, every single one of us put nails in him on the cross. I grew up liking to think that, oh, I don't, I don't hate Jesus. No, 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 I go to church. And yet, what became very obvious to me was I wasn't willing to let the Bible change me. And so, by default, I was showing hatred toward Jesus Christ. A person not willing to change does not love the Lord. A person that doesn't put the Lord first does not love him. They love themselves. We, if we want to call ourselves disciples of Jesus, you want to be a true Christian, he's got to come first in your life. Otherwise, it's hatred toward him. Verse 26, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify. For you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you at first because I was with you. Point number two, owned by the one. You know, it's interesting that I had no religious persecution when I was in the world. I had no persecution. My family didn't care what I did. They're like, oh, great. Well, you know, stop doing that bad stuff, young man. But once I became a Christian, a true disciple, all of a sudden my family's like, I can't believe you believe that stuff. What do you mean the family's not first? Literally, my, I went through that with my own family. And here I was, just trying to put into practice what I finally saw, and I got rejected by my family. That was tough. My mother, my brother, some of my closest friends stopped talking to me. And I didn't show hatred toward them, I showed them the truth. But because I showed them the truth, it convicted them, and then they hated me. Now, to this day, they will not say that they hated me. But it's obvious what happens. Persecution comes to every single person who wants to follow Jesus. There is no persecution for the person who stays in the world and continues to sin. Because they're high-fiving you. Great job. I'm with you. Look in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Pick it up in verse 28. <clears throat> Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Have you ever done stuff that you go, why did I do that? I promised God. I promised myself. I would never do that. Yeah. Since they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters. Insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Some others, you were right. Kids need to obey. 
They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You know, it is interesting how people that teach false doctrine group together. Because then they can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I feel better being around you. But when I'm around those guys, I feel guilty and I don't like being over there. But when you're in the world and you're involved in sin, nobody's guilty around you. Every single time I show up, people in my family feel guilty. I, I don't have to say anything. I just show up. Hi, Mom. Oh. <laughs> Love you, Mom. But there's a guilt there because God isn't first. Now listen, I love my mom to death. And I pray to God that someday she'll really make Jesus Lord of her life and not just be lip service. Pray for her. She lives here in town. And I love her to death. Hopefully I can maybe even see her today. But are people in the world encouraged when you show up? Or is there even a hatred sometimes? On campus, I know there's been many times, even this past year, been out sharing our faith and talking to people, oh, I know about your group. And we're like, yes, our group makes disciples. I know about your group. I'm like, okay, what do you know about our group? You guys teach people have to repent. Yeah? <laughs> you teach people have to be baptized. Yeah? You teach that people... Need to marry your disciples only. Mm, yeah. Then that makes us mad. Okay. Why are you so mad? Why don't you just marry a disciple, repent, and get baptized? <laughs> you guys teach that double dating, double dating is better. And I think I could go on a date anytime I want, anywhere I want. I'm great. How are your relationships going? Well, I'm on my third girlfriend, and the other two are pregnant. <laughs> okay. Guys, we are hated because we show up with the truth. And people, when they hear the truth, either they repent and change, or they hate it. Here's the awesome thing. Let's go back to uh, John chapter 15. He says in verse 19, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. You know, we're owned by Jesus. Persecution is part of discipleship, period. You will be persecuted. You're persecuted by family. You're persecuted by friends. You'll be persecuted by people that don't even know who you are. That's just part of who it is. But the question comes is, are you confident in who owns you? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Pick it up in verse 17. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual morality. All of those sins a man commits are outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Do you believe day and night, Christian? Do you really believe that you're owned by Jesus? And because you're owned by Jesus, you understand you were bought at a price. He paid for you. He paid to redeem you from what you earned, and that's death. He paid for that. And so our job is to honor him with our body. Where we go, what we do, and who we hang out with. We are to honor him with our body. You're owned by the one if you're a disciple. You know, it's interesting in uh, Dallas, the couple who leave the church are Tyler and Shay Sears. And they're a great, great couple. I was there a couple weeks ago, 
and uh, I got to meet their dog, Arlo. Now, Arlo uh, is named Arlo because in Dallas, there's Dallas, there's Arlington, and then Fort Worth. And Tyler they live in Arlington, and so they found a dog, and they called him Arlo, in honor of Arlington. Isn't that great? <laughs> One day, Tyler and Shay were out, and they're just kind of doing what they did, and they see this dog running around the neighborhood, and they're like, oh, hey, come here, dog. Tyler opens the back of his car, the dog just jumps in. He's like, well, there you go. <laughs> they take him home. They kind of clean him up. They call the vet. They call around. They can't figure out who the dog belongs to, and so they go, well, let's just call him Arlo. They named him Arlo, and... You know, and every time they'd open the front door, Arlo's out of there. Arlo's back in the world. And they go, Arlo, Arlo, come back, come back, come back. Arlo finally came on back, and they'd go get him, put him back in the car. Then they cleaned him up, and then they, they would take care of him, and then they'd feed him. Matter of fact, Arlo sleeps in their bed. <laughs> that will never happen in my house. <laughs> Although the other night, uh, Ellie and Christmas slept in Amanda's bed, right? <laughs> Ellie is Casey's dog, and Christmas is my dog, right? So Arlo is loved. He's been adopted by people that didn't own him. Couldn't find the owner, and over time, it's been amazing to watch. When they open the door now, Arlo will take off, and he'll stop and look back. He'll kind of... And Tyler goes, Arlo? And he comes on back. But it's so cool because you, you, we, we had a devotional there at their house, and Arlo just came right up in the middle of everybody. He's like wagging his tail. And he's just, he's, I swear if he could hug, he'd hug disciples. <laughs> he's just walking up to everyone, he's just nudging, and he's playing around in the middle of my lesson. I'm like, Arlo. <laughs> Arlo is deeply loved, and he knows it. He knows who his owner is. And now he doesn't stray back to the world. He'll go out a few feet and he'll stop and go, wait a minute, I know who my owner is. And he comes on back because he remembers he's loved, there's food there. <laughs> there's a nice warm bed. Some people who throw a bone for him. You, you with me here? Yeah. Are you keep running back to the world? Do you keep running back to sexual morality? Do you keep running back to perversion? Do you keep running back to pornography, guys? Are you with me? Do you keep running back to greed and selfishness? Or do you remember who's your owner? See, you were bought at a price. We need to look back and say, Jay, if everything's not okay, get on back in the house. And go back to where we're owned. I want to encourage you this morning to have a heart like Arlo. You were bought at a price. You got to stay close to the master. Amen? Back in John chapter 15. We have our third point. John 15. We're going to pick it up. Chapter 16, excuse me. Pick it up in verse 5. Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me where you're going. Because I've said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Amen. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you'll see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Point number three, mine made known to you. The most precious gift, gifts that Jesus gives are, are number one, forgiveness. Amen. Amen. And number two is Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit according to the scriptures? Or have you had a spiritual experience that has nothing to do with the Bible? Many people grow up being taught all kinds of things, but it doesn't really come from the Bible. It comes from assumptions made about what the Bible says about the Spirit. Yeah. The Bible says there's some purposes for the Spirit right here. 
Number one, he's the counselor, chapter 15, verse 26, that is sent to testify so that then you can go testify. That's why you're given the Spirit. A person not given the Spirit won't testify, or a person that repents and gets baptized and gets the Spirit that isn't testifying is going to be cut off. Because you're not following the Spirit. So the first purpose of the Spirit is so that we can testify. The second purpose of the Spirit Jesus gives here is to convict the world of guilt in regard to three thin things. Sin, righteousness, and judgments. In regard to sin, because without belief you won't repent. Many people claim to believe in Jesus and yet they continue living their lives just like they did before. In many campus ministries, I've noticed that the campus ministry looks just like the frat house. It's the same. It's got a prettier bow on top. The drunkenness, the foolishness, the debauchery, the lies, the deceit, the immorality is the same in a campus ministry that it is in a frat house. What in the world? No, the Holy Spirit was given so that you don't live that way anymore. The Holy Spirit is given to convict us of righteousness. Amen. You know that moment where you're, you're you know how you, you come to that place where you're trying to make a decision? Should I lie to my boss or should I tell him the truth? Lie to the boss? Tell the truth. If I lie, maybe he won't figure it out and I can get away with it. If I tell the truth, then he knows the truth. And I might get fired. Tell the truth. Lie. Tell the truth. In that moment, the Holy Spirit's going, Psst, hey, stupid. <laughs> tell the truth. Better to get fired and go to heaven. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's given so that you and I can be holy. The Holy Spirit is given to convict you so that day after day you're going, I'm going to go this way. That's why we get the Holy Spirit. So you can actually become a more righteous person. That's what he's there for. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit is given as judgment. It's interesting what Jesus says. He says, in regard to judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. We have a song we sing called, Whose Side Are You Fighting On? You know, in this universe we live in, there's two sides. There's good, and there's evil. There's God, and there's... Whose side are you fighting on? The Holy Spirit was given so that you make a clear decision every single day to fight on the Lord's side. Why? Right here he says that Satan's condemned already. If you're fighting on Satan's side, you are not condemned. Are you really living for Him, letting the Holy Spirit guide you? Look in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In verse 16, the Bible says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other, so that you not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. What happens to a person under the law? They're condemned. A person that's under the Spirit is set free. You guys with me here? The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, but, but, but I'm a Christian. Well, if you live like this in debauchery, impurity, immorality, fits of rage, selfish ambition, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if you're a disciple, the Holy Spirit was given to you to guide you away from that garbage. But if you are living that way, I don't have to tell you anything. The Bible just told you you're not going to make it. Are you living that way? Does that define your life? The acts of sinful nature are not confusing. Hmm, I wonder if it was sin. 
than when I stole that thing. No, it's sin. I wonder if it was sin when I slept with my girlfriend. No, it, it's sin. On the other hand, look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with his passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The question I have this morning for you is, do you understand that the Spirit is given to you because Jesus was making what was His known to you? He wants you to have what He has. He clearly understands sin, righteousness, and judgment. Do you? When we are walking in the Spirit, there's no judgment. And it's precious because we've been given forgiveness. Quite often I've talked to people in the South between... Texas and Louisiana and Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. And there's a sense inside of many people that the Holy Spirit is given so that you can do extraordinary, miraculous things. Like speak in tongues. That is not why the Holy Spirit is given. That was something that occurred for a period of time for a specific reason. That was to reach out to nations that needed to hear the gospel before the Bible was written. At this time, there is no need for speaking in tongues. And if you come back another time, we can probably talk about that. But many people think that the Holy Spirit is given so I can have this emotional experience and just feel all this stuff. That's not what the Holy Spirit is for. The Holy Spirit is given to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment so that you and I can keep in step with the Spirit. So that we can do what He does instead of what my sinful nature wants to do, which is in opposition to God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do what I used to do. I want to do what pleases God. Amen? I found this poem, and it talks about walking with God. And it goes like this. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're too big for feet. <laughs> my child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow, the walk of faith you would not know, so I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. <laughs> because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, one must, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. <laughs> you know, if you're not walking in the spirits, you leave some butt prints in the sand. And they go, oh, look, the, the footprints in the sand poem. Oh, how cute. And yet, if you're not walking in the Spirit, poof, now get up. The thing that I love about the Scriptures is that Jesus wants to make what's His known to us. He wants to give us the Holy Spirit so that we can live the Christian life. And let's close out in chapter 16 and verse 17. John 16. In verse 17, it says, Some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and after a, while, a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. And Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more? And then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman given birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that the child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth that... My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I've been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day I will, you will not ask in my name. 
I am not, excuse me, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see and that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered. But a time is coming, it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I will overcome the world. You know, Jesus came so that we would have peace. Point number four, so that in me, you may have peace. Do you live a life that's peaceful? Is there peace in your heart? Or are you stressed out, worried, whining, complaining? Are you walking with the Lord? You know, it is interesting, he he does talk here in verse 21 about a woman giving birth to a child in honor of Mother's Day. The title of the lesson is kind of a goofy one. You ready? It's all about more babies. What is this whole chapter about? It's all about us, chapter 15 and 16. It's all about us becoming men and women who will walk with him and be in the vine so that more people can become disciples. It's about having more babies. Now listen, I've seen three babies born. And I just thank God every day that I'm a man. (laughs) And I remember when Melissa was coming along. And we're in the hospital there. And uh, Helen and I, you know, we talked about everything. Went through the classes and all this. I knew how to push and, you know, all this stuff, you know. It's really hard on me, you know. (laughs) And it comes down to that moment where, where... Everything's happening, and, and, and the baby ain't coming. And, and Helen kind of gets this worried look on her face. She's like, it's not happening. It's not working. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. Push, you know, I don't know. And, uh, I mean, I did my part. And, and, then, and then Helen just kind of goes, I, I, I don't know what to do. And this, this old nurse comes in. And she goes, honey, it's all up to you. And Helen goes, the fear left her face. The worry about the pain, like if you've seen childbirth, oh my goodness. The worry about the pain was gone. And when that woman said, honey, it's all up to you, Helen goes, it's up to me? <laughs> her face changed. She goes, it's up to me? And then he goes, yeah, honey, it's up to you. She goes, okay. <laughs> you know? It was awesome. She overcame the pain. She overcame the fear, the grief. And there comes Melissa. It was awesome. You know, when you realize that your walk with God, really, it's all up to you. The fear of, well, maybe I'm going to fail. Well, guess what? Let me help you understand something. You're going to fail. The fear of, well, maybe I'll sin. (gasps) Yes, let me help you. You're going to sin, unfortunately. Maybe you feel like somebody in the the church might hurt you. And you're afraid. I don't know if I really want to be a Christian. Or sometimes I feel like getting away because that person hurt me and that person let me down. And when you understand that it's all up to you. And your walk with God, you're going to push on through. Amen? Come on, Come on, Matt. I really believe that when you learn to push through, you'll have peace. And then more babies will come about because of you. Amen? So you take the first letter of each point. Much fruit for his glory. Owned by the one. Mine made known to you, and so that in me you might have peace, it spells moms. Today, in honor of Mother's Day, I just want to make sure that you take care of your moms today, amen? But in the church here, we need to become mothers and fathers of more babies. 
we need to take, take care of the babies that God has given us. There are many young disciples in the church and many older who have a lot of hurts and problems that we need to deal with. Let's take care of one another. You can learn a lot from the way your mom took care of you. Amen? And let's really have a heart. Because, guys, at the end of the day, it's all about more babies. Amen.